Oh, there's, yeah, now it counts down to it. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Jersey Waterworks sixth annual conference. I'm uh, presenting, I'm here to um, introduce the keynote speaker and presentation, the race for clean water, racial equity, collaboration, and resilience. I'm really pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Delone White Newsom. I've had the pleasure of getting to know her over the last year through the Climate Resilient and Equitable Water Systems Cruise Initiative that she is responsible for as the Senior Program Officer at the Kresge Foundation. She has led this group through a difficult year with grace. She's a core team member of the Kresge's Climate Change Health and Equity Initiative, supporting grant making across the public health sector. Delone also served as the Director of Federal Policy at the West Harlem Environmental Action, We Act, where she led national campaigns to ensure that concerns of low-income communities of color were integrated into federal policy, particularly on the issues of clean air, climate change, and health. She's also an adjunct professor and provides leadership on various boards. A native of Detroit, Delone earned a PhD in Environmental Health Sciences from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a master's degree in environmental engineering from Southern Methodist University, and a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Northwestern University. Uh, you can learn more about her um, on our website in the bio section, and I'm going to hand it over to her. And um, please, you know, use the Q&A to submit questions. All right. Thank you so much, Mo, for the kind introduction. And I hope that there's some folks out there because it's showing zero participants on my end. So hopefully there are some folks out there. But so honored to be a part of the sixth annual uh, Jersey Waterworks Conference. And even though I can't see your beautiful faces, um, it's still great to be sharing this virtual space with you. So next slide. Um, I am very thankful to be calling from my home in southeastern Michigan that sits on the lands of the Mississauga and the Potawatomi. And I want to acknowledge, uh-oh, I hear some folks saying that I can't hear. Are you there? Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I'm seeing in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Well, let me know if you can't see or hear me. No biggie. Um, but I want to acknowledge the lands that um, I'm calling from the lands of the Mississauga and the Potawatomi. And so if you could go to the next slide, Mo. And I encourage each of you uh, to do the same. Uh, throw your name in the chat, um, where you're calling from. If you're aware of that, uh, that would be wonderful. So in that same spirit, uh, I also want to acknowledge a couple of folks. Um, if you could go back a slide, Mo. <laughs> Thank you. I also want to acknowledge a couple of folks that I have had the honor to get to know that hail from New Jersey. Um, awesome folks that I've crossed paths with in some point in my life, and they are powerhouse water warriors and environmental justice warriors. And I just want to call their names. So Dr. Nikki Sheets, Professor Ana Batista, Drew Curtis, Kim Gaddy, Lorene Bowles, Andy Cricken, Mishka Mishko, and now all of you, the friends and supporters of Jersey Water Work. So thank you all for the great work that you've done and that you continue to do as we face multiple crises in our country, both in the form of racism and in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we have been facing pandemics for centuries, and some of those pandemics have been specifically due to a lack of water quality and water infrastructure. And so I've been teaching a Masters of Public Health course for about nine years now, and you know, understanding the cause of waterborne disease and the lack of water quality has been a key topic that we have covered both for issues internationally and the United States. But what's crazy is that as I study this more and as I learn more, the water challenges that we face right now are very similar to the water challenges we faced back in the day. And again, what's even more unfortunate is that some of the same causes of those water challenges centuries ago are the water challenges we face now that have the same causes and the same root causes. So back in the 1930s, or really the 1830s, I'm sorry, New York City was hit hard by cholera. 
and uh, that's an infection of the intestines. And particularly, the poorest neighborhoods were hit, uh, an area known as Five Points, which were called the slums, where African Americans and Irish Catholic immigrants were the majority. So while modern sewage and wastewater treatment have helped eradicate uh, cholera in most countries and in the U.S., the problem wasn't just the lack of infrastructure or water infrastructure. Um, it was the presence of racism, the real presence of racism. And so historical documents and uh, some of the commentary from civic leaders back then that are exhibited by the quotes on the slide show that even 200 years ago, almost 200 years ago, some people just didn't matter then and they still don't matter now. And so those same narratives that drive inequitable policies and a broken system that do a disservice to low income people and communities of color are, are still present in our society now. Do you agree with that? Throw it in the chat if you do. Next slide, Mo. And while the majority of our water infrastructure in the United States was installed over really three major time frames, started in the early 1900s, it was the early 70s that really brought out the landmark, landmark policies like the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, again, enacted to help protect the health of the public. But these regulations accompanied with compliance and enforcement that began almost 50 years ago have definitely had a positive impact. So I want to say that. However, the regulations by themselves have not been quite able to solve for the whole problem. In fact, they have not been able to really fully counter the social political environment girded in institutional and structural racism that time and time again fails to protect all communities in the same way. Next slide. So during the same time frame, while home ownership was an easy reality for many white middle class families, it was actually a different story for black folks. And I remember my parents and grandparents talking about this. Redlining policies increased patterns of residential segregation for black folks enabling municipalities to more easily deprive majority black neighborhoods of access to essential services, including water and sewer. These maps shown in the slide are from Groundwork USA's Climate Safe Neighborhood Project that show here in Union County, New Jersey, that the redlining overlaid with some areas of imperviousness and lack of sewage systems. Again, this was all happening in majority black neighborhoods. And so in most communities, there has always been a higher risk, particularly for communities of color in low income communities for not only just a lack of water infrastructure, but other environmental factors. So all in all, the racism inherent in policies, practice and enforcement or the lack thereof over time has made water hazardous to our health, destructive to our homes and disruptive to the lives of so many. So this tangled interconnected history of water access, water infrastructure and water policy in this country we call the United States of, Amer of America has been complicated and the fractures and the brokenness of the system continue to be amplified by racism. A far stretch from what my mentor shared with me is the fact that water is life and that no one owns it, despite the actions that we have taken to mess up this great life source. Next slide, Mo. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the water challenges that you and, and the state of New Jersey have been facing. Lead in pipes, combined sewer overflows, environmental injustice, sea level rise, legacy pollution. But even with these many crises, you have used it as an opportunity to make waves in New Jersey that have been felt across this country. So you've come together in many rooms through committees and a governance structure to create a shared vision and develop with diverse stakeholders many pieces of legislation and policy led by community leaders. So that's to be commended. You've developed an infrastructure toolkit to help municipal leaders plan and make sure that green stormwater infrastructure is included as a solution set. That is to be commended. 
you've helped advocate for the state's stormwater management rules that include a requirement that green stormwater infrastructure must be used to meet stormwater management and water quality standards. That is to be commended. And I reckon that some of you on this call have also uh, had something to do with the new environmental justice bill that permits the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to deny or condition certain permits due to the cumulative disproportionate impacts of pollution in environmental justice communities. That's a decade plus long fight. And again, that is to be commended. And so, yes, despite all of these challenges, you remain a model and a source of inspiration for many communities facing similar challenges across this country, especially as I think about my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. Next slide, Mo. Um, as a little girl, so that was supposed to be, so congratulations. <laughs> So next slide, Mo. As a little girl growing up in Detroit, um, I took a lot of things for granted. I lived in a state surrounded by the beautiful Great Lakes. I drank my water and still do straight from the tap. And I even had streets that really didn't have any flooding after a hard rain. My schoolgirl crush that would out, is what I'll call it on the environment started with water, with my elementary school science fair project, and then grew and shifted as I pursued chemical engineering with a minor in environmental justice and environmental journalism. I began working in industry and I became responsible for managing wastewater and stormwater at facilities across the United States, realizing that the negative impact that wastewater and stormwater could have on communities if I didn't do my job right, could be detrimental. And so I knew the importance of a good, strong NEPTES permit. I knew the importance of a strong stormwater pollution prevention plan that had community engagement as a part of it. And so as an engineer, I understood the technical importance of water. Um, I had gotten my master's in environmental engineering, so I kind of knew how a wastewater treatment plant worked. And I had written, again, several permits and made sure that I had a good working relationship with my local and state regulators because I wanted to build not only the best plan to keep the community safe and make my facility accountable, but I also didn't want the system to fail the communities that I strive to protect. Well, even with those good intentions, and I'm sure many of you will agree or maybe not, I learned that even though you might have some good people in good places, if the system isn't strong, it will fail. And that's exactly what continues to happen in communities across this country. And unfortunately to my family in Detroit that have made this water work intimately real and, and my passion. So next slide. There were several highly intense rain events that happened in Metro Detroit that caused severe flooding uh, in 2019. Three of these storms brought five feet of water into my parents' home, one of the uh, pictures shown here, three times over the course of four months, right? The water came in through the basement windows, the drains in the basement floors, sewage. So there were furnaces, sofas, sofas, boxes of clothes, pictures, stuff that couldn't be replaced was just floating everywhere. And my parents were forced to live with us for a little while, as well as in a hotel. And so this combination of inadequate infrastructure around their home, inadequate barriers near a water body that was near their home, an unmaintained sewer system, again, a lack of accountability by the municipal leaders and racism, resulted not only in a major loss of stuff for my parents and their neighbors, but it has also impacted my parents' physical and mental health as well. And so while I know this is my parents' story, a couple of folks in the little city of Detroit, I would imagine that this might be the story of some of the folks that are in this virtual audience. And maybe you would agree that a failure of a system in protecting the people that it's called to protect is a failure for us all. Next slide. I know that this story is probably not isolated, but it's one instance that drives the work that I've tried to do over the past four years with the Kresge Foundation through the Cruise Initiative. The Cruise Initiative includes over 30 organizations and probably 100 plus folks that are committed to transforming water systems across this country. So they not only address climate driven urban flooding, but the institutional and structural racism that exists across the water sector. 
And so this amazing group of folks includes water utility leaders, municipal leaders, economists, environmental justice leaders, researchers, environmental conservation, that's a little bit of everybody. It's, it's a mixed crew, essentially, that are fighting for smart, equitable water solutions, similar to Jersey Water Works. And one major thing that I have learned from this crew is that the fight is not a quick race, but more like a marathon. Next slide. So I want to ask a question. Um, how many of y'all have ever run a marathon? And if you have, just throw in which one, a marathon or a half marathon. And I will be truthful. Um, I don't like running, <laughs> but I got persuaded to run in the Detroit Free Press International Half Marathon in 2019. And it actually starts in Detroit. You run through Canada and then it comes back to Detroit. And so I'm a super novice runner. I trained for about three months. I got advice from really experienced runners. But I realized that even in all of my preparation, that I still faced incredible challenges on the day of the run. There were 21,000 runners from different cities and states and countries, different experience levels. And it made the running pathway crowded and annoying. And some people were just rude, all right? They were just rude. And then the differences in elevation across the marathon pathway. Oh my gosh, there was an eight foot climb from Detroit to Canada over the Ambassador Bridge. And that was just crazy. I felt thirsty and alone. I realized I had started out with my husband and a couple of folks at the start of the race. And then I realized I was soon by myself a couple of minutes in. The underground tunnel from Canada to Detroit was crowded and stifling. And at that point, there were so many folks giving up and just sitting on the side because literally you were physically and mentally drained at that 10 mile mark. And so I constantly questioned my preparation. And I constantly questioned if I had enough to make it to the end of this race, because it seemed like I would never get to the finish line. But despite these challenges, I made it across the finish line in two hours and 44 minutes. And I still look back and I'm amazed that I didn't just pass out. Because even with these challenges through the marathon, there were pieces of inspiration and signals of progress that kept me going. So the signals of progress, of course, were the mile markers along the way, indicating that I was getting closer to the zero. And then there were pieces of inspiration in the form of complete strangers holding up signs along the route, cheering me on. So I knew I had some allies I didn't know. It was so much diversity. We had Detroiters, Canadians, Asian Americans, those from the Caribbean, all struggling together, encouraging each other, giving each other what we needed to get past the finish line. And then we had little pit stops along the way, little shots of Gatorade and water that quenched my thirst enough to keep on going. And most importantly, I had an awesome soundtrack in my iPhone with perfectly timed songs ranging from the gospel grade of Mahalia Jackson to Bruno Mars to keep me motivated. And then that constant reminder of the North Star, the picture of my daughters in my iPhone, because I knew that I wanted them to be healthy and take care of themselves and end some of the generational health challenges that had taken the lives of my dad and others close to me too soon. And so I needed to be a role model for them so they could run their own marathon one day. So Jersey Waterworks, continue running your marathon on behalf of the families, communities, and the cities in this great state of New Jersey. You have a clear vision and a North Star. You've gotten some inspiration. You've seen some signals of progress. You are on your way. And much like you need a good pair of running shoes, some good music and the right clothing and the right preparation to run a marathon, I would propose to you as you all move into 2021, and strive towards that finish line that reads smart infrastructure and strong communities, that there are three essential pieces that I encourage you to keep in your fanny pack along this marathon. Collaboration, racial equity, and resilience. And I believe these three are so essential to continuing to transform New Jersey's water infrastructure for the greater good of the communities you serve. So let's quickly start with collaboration. Next slide, Mo. We have witnessed from the highest level of leadership in this land how not collaborating <laughs> can be truly detrimental to life, detrimental to hope, and detrimental to the culture of the United States. Humility, 
listening, learning, and flexing sometimes when you don't want to are some of the elements that make collaboration work. I've seen evidence of this over the last four years through the CRUISE initiative. The foundational collaborations, for example, that have been ignited by the U.S. Water Alliance's Water Equity Tables and Climate Resilience Boot Camp, again, that has brought together water utility leaders, social justice leaders, and local foundations to create and operationalize equity roadmaps to achieve water equity. In fact, the last in-person gathering was in downtown Camden of these 17s that's pictured in the upper left-hand corner of this slide. There have been collaborations between scientists and flood survivors across communities in this country through the Higher Ground Initiative. There's been collaborations with Chesapeake Bay Foundation and Quantified Ventures, an investment firm, and the city of Hampton, Virginia, that just last week finalized a $12 million environmental impact bond to deal with flooding in the city of Hampton. So again, there are so many examples of collaboration, and I want to point out that collaboration with unusual partners or new friends is always more powerful, more protective, and extends the possibilities, particularly as we all work on these critical water issues. Next slide. The second element to winning this marathon is maintaining a strong focus and accountability for racial equity and justice. Now, this year has been the culmination of multiple crises. Uh, it is no longer tolerable for us to be bystanders to injustice. And the unfortunate reality that black and brown folks have been experiencing for decades trying to live in these United States. We just can't do it. And the way that those of us that have power and privilege uh, have worked to eliminate these protections and resources to eradicate clean water, water safeguards and affordability is shameful. This is no longer acceptable. So I want to highlight a couple of organizations that were founded on and continue to maintain a strong, unwavering focus on racial equity and justice. One is EcoAction, a community-based organization that works throughout the state of Georgia, and they work with a diverse set of partners, much like you all, to create a learning network that trains leaders on the effects of racism and white supremacy and how certain communities are disproportionately impacted. And they work hand in hand with their municipal leaders and I continue to be impressed by their work. Also the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus that's led by Policy Link and the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, again, have been influential, so influential in strengthening our federal policy and educating water leaders and key decision makers across this country around workforce development, response and recovery. And again, each of the policy platforms that they developed were crafted and led by people of color organizations. And again, beyond our community organizations, we have so much exciting leadership that's happening by our municipal leaders that are really integrating racial equity into their operations particularly the leadership of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange and how they're doing their work, the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network and progressive utilities like Seattle, San Francisco, Atlanta, and right there, Camden in New Jersey. So I encourage each of you to understand what power and privilege you hold, because we all have some, and, and how you can use that to transform water in New Jersey and to incorporate a racial equity analysis in everything you do. And so a mentor of mine told me a long time ago when I was working with We Act for Environmental Justice is that you have to ask at least four questions for everything you do. One, what am I trying to do? Two, who will this benefit? Three, will anybody be unintentionally hurt or harmed? And four, one that I added, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable? So I hope that this will help maintain that focus on racial equity and justice through, again, the marathon that y'all are running. Next slide. And last but not least, resilience. And in any marathon, resilience is a requirement. Again, I remember running that half marathon in Detroit and thinking during multiple points in the race, I am not sure I can make it. I was tired, beat up, my feet, <laughs> my body was hurting. And it seemed like every step forward was harder to take than the next one. And I know some of you have to be feeling that way now between COVID, our economy, our lack of leadership, climate change, like we are at this point where we want to turn in or like really throw in the virtual tile, if I can say that. 
but we can't. I think about some of our partners that have been working in New Orleans, particularly in the Gulf Coast, who have been hit by hurricanes, COVID and flooding at the same time. I think about our partners in Milwaukee at Milwaukee Water Commons that while fighting for water and equitable COVID-19 testing, they have also had to be the first responders in their community and throughout the state after the killing of George Floyd that turned our world upside down. I think about the first responders and the healthcare workers that are directly providing superhuman services to our sick. And I also want to recognize our utility partners, both on the water and energy side, that have, again, provided moratoriums on water shutoffs that have directly and indirectly saved the lives of folks so folks can continue to wash their hands and cook and clean and hydrate. And so again, I often say that black, brown and indigenous folks in this country have always been resilient because they had to be. <laughs> but just because people are resilient does not give us the license to allow our systems, policies and structures to continue to fail them. Jersey Waterworks, I charge you with making sure that at least one year from now, five years from now, that the institutions, policies, and changes that you are fighting for are even more resilient, guaranteeing the quality and quantity of life for all people in this state. Next slide. So I encourage you, Jersey Waterworks, to run your marathon. And as we enter 2021, don't forget what 2020 has taught you. Don't forget the history Fortify vision for 2021 that is grounded in deep collaboration, advancing racial equity and radical resilience. Your medal will be realized in the strong communities and the smart infrastructure and the legacy you are leaving for that next generation. So again, congratulations on this sixth annual conference and I wish you all continued prosperity, health and fortitude for what's to come. Thank you. Thank you. That was those are really um, inspiring words and so needed at this time, um, especially the analogy of a marathon. <laughs> I think we all feel that really, really, really feeling that. Um, so I did want to. There's a few questions here I wanted to um, ask you. Um, so from J JL Davis, um, she asked, what is one of the biggest challenges you faced in collaborating with other groups around water equity issues and how did you handle it? That's a great question. And I think one of the many challenges, but one of the challenges was really learning how to talk to each other and understanding each other's language. I remember some of the groups at the beginning um, you know, didn't understand the challenges that water utilities faced. And then water utilities didn't understand why communities were so mad and upset. And so I think a lot of the when you're starting a new relationship is really one listening to each other, learning how each other talks, you know, the language and then creating that shared language so you can then begin to build that relationship and build trust. And so I think realizing that that takes time and you can't just jump into the work, but you have to work at the relationship first and understand and communicate. That was so essential. Um, and this is a question from Chris Sturm. Uh, there are big opportunities in New Jersey to improve how local water and sewer board members represent the demographics of the communities they serve. Can you advise us on achieving more diverse boards? There have been some excellent examples, and I want to call out the Community Water Center in uh, Central Valley in California. Um, I encourage you all to, to, to check them out because um, they have essentially uh, cultivated leadership from the community to then be able to take on and run for these positions on water boards or water councils. And so I would encourage you, if you don't see the representation that you want, then there is a need to cultivate that leadership from within. And so there are some wonderful models out there as to how to begin to do that, because the worst thing that you could have is again tokenism and just having folks there but not really again representing and coming in, in a way that it's informed and re really being able to shape policy and practice so 
I would really encourage you to check out the Community Water Center's Leadership Development Program, and there's probably many others out there. And I think a similar question from Jerry Flatch is how do we engage a more diverse population to careers in water, such as water operations? Yeah, so I, I mean, I never knew about the wonders of water. Like I started back in elementary school with my Home Depot testing kit for pH. And I mean, it was like very low maintenance, but you know, I think it has to start at, at that point at the elementary school level, at the middle school level, because if I wasn't exposed to half of the things that I've been exposed to before that time, I wouldn't even thought about it. And particularly if you don't see people that look like you uh, in these different positions, that's also a challenge as well, because it's like, if I can't see myself, then why would I think that I might be able to accomplish that? So I think really having this broad understanding and, and really focusing on our middle school and our elementary school young women and, and young men um, that this this water management, this could be a career. And I think about that with my own daughters, because unfortunately they have two parents that are engineers. And so they, again, are kind of biased toward the sciences and math, but that's not enough. Um, so I think starting as young as possible is super important. Awesome. Uh, um, and I just want to encourage folks who are, um, you know, watching, participating to, we have a few more minutes. So if you have another question, um, please submit it into the Q&A. Um, when I was listening Jello, to your speaking, I mean, one of the first things that you talked about was um, the need to go beyond the regulations uh, to counter the inequities in our society. And I was just wondering if you could give some, maybe examples from the cruise initiative of some of what's being done right now to go beyond the regulations. Well, you know, I, I just think about to my days, you know, uh, really my entire life kind of dedicated to raising up the voices of those that are invisible, um, those that are overlooked, um, and those that seemingly have no power and privilege in these places and spaces that can change and shift policies and practices. And I, I think we, <laughs> there is a, there's, there's a, a you have to go again, and, and I hope I'm answering your question, uh, beyond our, our normal practices. And I, I'm trying to think of, I, I would say, and maybe I would uplift the work of Deep, Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, that again, um, starting out, they hadn't really focused on water issues. But what they soon came to find out is that water issues were becoming a challenge for many of the communities in the four or five states that they're working and that there needed to be at the top of it some education happening. And so um, I think if we're going to build a more resilient system, um, we have to make sure that the folks that are being impacted the most are educated and armed to really push and promote changes in that system that's going to be a benefit to, to everybody. Um, and so I, I would say, again, going beyond is, is kind of the things that we're used to, that we're comfortable with, um, the folks that we're already friends with. Um, we have to expand that, and that requires us expanding ourselves. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, with this new administration, we're on the cusp of a new administration in this country, and there are many opportunities, you know, I think that people are thinking about moving forward. So I just want to know from you know, your perspective, what do you see as like the greatest opportunity that we have that we need to kind of just jump on um, moving forward in this upcoming year? So there are so many needs and priorities, and I have been fortunate to have many conversations over the past couple of months with folks that are a part of the transition team, uh, and, and might be doing something in the administration. And so my priority, I would say for anything is the public health. So what are those things that, you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit, um, the easy stuff that we can do now that is gonna protect the health of our public across this country, because that, that is, that's our primary concern. So how do we, I don't even know how to say this, roll forward what's been rolled back 
That should be one of the first priorities. Um, how do we figure out how to deploy resources, resources and funds in a way that address so many of the issues that are happening in our communities around infrastructure, um, whether it's changing out, you know, lead lines, which I know that's something your state has, has been working on, um, you know, whether it's making sure, you know, kind of the barriers, as I think about my parents' home, there has still not been any remedies uh, at their home in terms of setting up protection because spring is right around the corner. <laughs> so again, what are those emergent needs that are going to protect the health of the public that we can, one, prioritize in this administration um, in terms of rolling forward, but also um, are there are there areas of low hanging fruit where we need to make sure that we have the, the the ability to deploy financial resources through maybe existing mechanisms and new mechanisms to get to these states and communities? Um, and so I, there, there's so much there, so many priorities, but I would say maybe those two, because I could talk about that for days. I know, and I apologize, I asked you that at the very, very end. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you so much. This has been such a great way to start this conference um, and our journey and our marathon. Um, so I just want to thank you. And um, and, <laughs> thank you all. and I wish you a wonderful conference.